Hi and welcome to Enchantment of Eternity's book to show comparison for The Expanse Season 5 Episode 2 Churn. This video is a part of a series of videos where I compare The Expanse TV show to that of the novels on which it is based. So I'll just start with a spoiler warning for The Expanse up to the very end of Season 5. If you have not seen all of Season 5 you will not want to watch this video otherwise some things may be spoiled for you. However, this video will not contain spoilers from future events beyond Season 5, so if you haven't read the books beyond Season 5, don't worry, you are safe from any spoilers that occur after Season 5. So our episode begins with a Belter pirate ship attacking a colony vessel. Uh, thus enters Kamina Drummer and her crew, where they threaten the pirate ship claiming to own this territory, meaning they have the right for 10% of the spoils and uh, that the pirates are not allowed to kill anyone on the colony ship. The pirates uh, reject Drummer's claim and target lock her ship. Drummer responds by having two other ships in her command reveal themselves and fire on the pirates they manage to disable their ship. So the pirate agrees to Drummer's terms and Drummer tells him to make sure everyone knows that she owns this territory now and he agrees. Drummer then communicates with the colony ship and tells their captain she's uh, contacted the UN to let them know where they are and that the inner ships will be coming to rescue them. But the captain is not grateful. She's outraged saying that Drummer took everything from them. Drummer cuts off the call and then says not everything. We then meet her crew as they bond over dinner which includes three women, Drummer, Akswana and Michio, and three men, Serge, Joseph, and Berthold. The six of them are involved in a polyamorous relationship where they are all consider themselves family. We see them bonding over dinner where Berthold gets an alert on a ship. Drummer has been tracking and sends it to her asking if she had a bounty on it. But she answers that it's Klaus Ashford's ship and that she has been searching for it for a long time and never thought that she would find it. So in the novels, this storyline exists, but it didn't belong to Kamina Drummer. In the novels, Drummer doesn't, in fact, appear until this book, Nemesis Games, but in it, she played a fairly minor role as Fred Johnson's security chief on Tycho during the crisis that occurs there this season, where she essentially served as Johnson's second. The show gave her a similar role in season 2, but from there it got expanded mainly because the producers liked Kara G, the actor who portrayed her, so Drummer would encompass many other roles uh, that different book characters played in the novels, such as Sam, Bull, and Michio Pa, and uh, her role was expanded to include many show original material. In this season, Bull is given uh, the role that Drummer, Drummer played in Book 5, which is ironic since Drummer played the role Bull played in Book 3. This season, Drummer is given the role of Micho Pa, a character she also took the role of in Season 3 as parts of Pa, Bull's, and Ashford's storyline in the novels were given to Drummer and Ashford in the show. However, in the novels, uh, Michio Pa resurfaced as a pirate who has a polyamorous relationship with her crew and uh, must reluctantly join Mark Arnaris's free navy. So clearly that's the role they gave to Drummer this season, but it's not a one-to-one -one comparison. First of all, the biggest difference from Drummer's storyline in the show and Michio Pa's storyline in the novels is that Pa's storyline takes place in Book 6. And season 5, of course, adapts the events of book 5. So that changes the dynamic a bit. And uh, will also severely change the dynamic of Drummer's storyline in season 6 as compared to Michio Pa's storyline in book 6. Secondly, giving Pa's storyline to Drummer changes the storyline a bit because Drummer has a different backstory than Pa. In the novels, Pa had a falling out with Fred Johnson and considered him an enemy. And although Drummer in the show also had a falling out with John since she mostly still considered him an ally. Also, Drummer has a history with Marco Arnaris in the show where she had the chance to kill him but didn't and he in turn killed her friend and colleague Klaus Ashford when Ashford tried to hunt Marco down. 
Where no such animosity exists between Pa and the Naros in the novels other than Pa didn't agree with his actions. Thirdly, there were many years between when we last saw Pa in Book 3 to when we saw her again in Book 6, so the prospect that she could form a tight-knit polyamorous family and become a space pirate in that time is believable and makes sense. Whereas, it's only been roughly a year since we lost Saul Drummer in Season 4, so the fact that she could form such a tight-knit family in such a short time is less believable and thus you don't buy the bond between them as much. Further, while Pa becoming a pirate makes sense, it makes a lot less sense for Drummer to become one as that seems out of character for her. And another thing worth note is the fact that a member of Drummer's crew is named Michio. Uh, it's a shout out to the book character of Michio Pa and is not of course meant to be an adaptation of Michio Pa in the show as clearly that role, the role that Pa played in the novels was given to Drummer. But still it's a nice call out to the novels. So because it seems Drummer doesn't quite fit into this role that Michio Pa served in the novels and it seems they tried to cram her into this role for storytelling purposes, I'm going to give this a negative three. Next, we go to Earth, or more specifically Baltimore, where we're treated to an amazing long take that starts with the cityscape of Toronto, <coughs> I mean Baltimore, and then <laughs> zooms down to Amos. Amos walks through the city until coming to his destination, the house uh, that he discovered Lydia last lived in. When he knocks, an elderly man named Charles answers the door and Amos asks uh, if he can come in. Charles offers Amos some tea, but Amos interrupts to ask about Lydia. Charles recognizes Amos as Timothy, the young boy that Lydia raised, and says that Lydia has been waiting her whole life for him to return. He then starts to make him feel guilty about how he abandoned her, and Amos gets upset and asks how she died. Charles replies with anger as he is, has the nerve to come back after all this time, and that's all he has to say, but Amos stands up and intimidates him and again demands to know how she died. Charles explains that Lydia died in her sleep of natural causes, then goads Amos by saying that he can go ahead and beat him uh, if it will relieve his guilt, and then he breaks down and starts crying, saying he don't know what he's going to do now that Lydia is dead, and Amos gently touches him and says tea would be nice. Over tea, Charles convinces Amos he was good for her and they have a more friendly conversation until Charles reveals that he's going to have to move as the house doesn't belong to him, it belongs to a former associate of Lydia, a guy named Eric who is taking the house back after Lydia died. However, Amos tells him to stop packing and then he leaves. So in the novels, we get a very similar scene to this with a few differences. First of all, Charles lives in Philadelphia, not Baltimore, which apparently is where Lydia relocated to, but I understand the show wanting to simplify the location. Also, I will say Charles and Amos were less hostile towards each other in the novels. Charles never tried to make Amos feel guilty about abandoning Lydia and was only a little stern with Amos when he seemed to question how much he loved Lydia and Amos immediately backed down from that. As far as Amos, he did briefly uh, threaten him once, uh, but it didn't go on for that long, and Amos profusely apologized for coming off strong once he recognized that Charles wasn't responsible for Lydia's death and was in fact good for her. Also, a slight difference was in the novels, Eric didn't own the house, he was bankrolling Lydia, but stopped that after she died so that Charles could no longer afford the house and would have to go on basic and move to government housing. So both versions work for their respective mediums, as Amos in the show is a bit different than the books, as he's more socially awkward, which came off wonderfully in the scene. But I wasn't a fan of how hostile they were towards each other at the first and how Charles tried to guilt Amos seemed unnecessary and like it was just there to artificially create tension so I'm going to give this a negative one. 
So next we go back to Tycho Station where we see Bull and Fred Johnson converse uh, while traveling on a lift. Johnson tries to convince Bull to lighten up um, on stuff like the Rosinate and uh, Bull doesn't want to hear it. They talk about their past and how they fought in the war together and how Johnson reached out and offered Bull a job after he was broke and Bull accepted it but doesn't care much about the calls of belters the way that Fred Johnson does. Johnson jokes that Bull is angling for his job but Bull responds by saying he doesn't even like the one he has. Johnson tries to convince Bull that the belt having their own warships to police themselves is a good thing but Bull responds by telling Johnson that his problem is that he thinks if someone's the underdog that automatically means they're the good guys. <clears throat> so this is similar to the novels in some ways as Johnson and Bull were friends who served and fought together in the past and Bull only came to Tycho because Johnson invited him. However, in the novels Bull wasn't just poor but he was a drunk and a bit suicidal and it was implied he was suffering from PTSD. So Johnson's job offer was literally a lifesaver for Bull and Bull had no issue with the calls of the belt and in fact he did his best to fit in. Now I mentioned this before but I'm reminded here that I think the book's version of Bull works so much better as it makes sense an Earther living and working in the belt for the head of the OPA would support the belter cause and not be so anti-belter like he comes off here so I'm going to give this a negative one. So next we go over to the Rosinate um, where we see uh, uh, Sakai overseeing the repairs, uh, which are very loud and distracting. Holden asks how much longer they're going to take. Sakai replies 12 hours, 18 if they do it perfect, or 6 if they don't mind dying. Holden tells her that 18 hours sounds great. Sakai suggests Holden return to his room on Taiko to get some undisturbed rest, but Holden refuses, saying that the Rosie is home to him. Holden then checks his messages, scanning through uh, Amos, Alex, and Naomi to see if he got anything, but he didn't. But he did get a call from Monica Stewart and listens to the message where she tells him uh, that there's information she hasn't shared with him. Has she sure someone is trying to steal the protomolecule? She asks Holden to meet her at a certain time. Holden sends a message in response saying that he's not going to meet her, but after he records it, he listens to Monica's message again, specifically the part where she says someone's trying to steal the protomolecule, and then he realizes that he can't just leave this alone as the risk is too big. So in the novel, Sakai and Holden never really interacted in such a friendly manner. They were mostly all business. But the scene where uh, Holden's flipping through his messages does express how lonely Holden was in the novels without his crew and how he didn't know what to do with himself. Although in the novels, Alex and Amos did leave messages uh, for him from time to time. Amos's messages were always really short and to the point, but Alex were more involved and friendly. But he never got a message from Naomi which really bothered him. Also it's implied that Holden listening to Monica's messages in earshot uh, of Sakai is what tipped the extremist off that Monica was a threat since we know Sakai is involved with them. In the novels Holden actually talks to Sakai about the mystery of the missing ships to get his advice on it and Holden even hires a data wonk to help him track the missing ships and Holden and Monica actually have a conversation before she goes missing where uh, Holden tell, um, turns her down on her request to use the protomolecule to summon Miller but tells her he is looking into the missing ships and that he consulted Fred Johnson, Sakai and a data wonk and Monica is outraged and asks him if he's stupid to involve so many people in this and she suggests they could come 
after them for doing so. And so Holden feels guilty and directly responsible uh, when they do nab Monica. Either way, I think I prefer the book's version of events. As far as Holden's loneliness, I understand the show has less time to dwell on this, and I think they did do a decent enough job getting that across in this scene. But as far as uh, the preamble to Monica going missing, I like the angle that Holden is directly responsible much better, so I'm going to give this a negative two. Next, we see Holden go to Monica's room to meet her, but her door was left open. He knocks on it, but no one answers, so Holden enters to find the room in disarray. He calls her hand terminal, but then hears it in the room. He then calls Fred Johnson to tell him that they have a problem, as clearly she was abducted. So in the novels, Holden goes to Monica's room after not hearing from her for a while, and in that case, the door is locked. After she doesn't respond, Holden calls security to ask if they know her whereabouts, and they inform him that her hand terminal wasn't used for several days, meaning she was gone. She has gone without eating or drinking anything for that long. Uh, as they also confirm that she hasn't left the station. So Holden asks for a security team to come and he has to wait until they arrive to open the door and let him in and they discover that the room is in disarray and assume she's been abducted. So I actually prefer the show's more simplified version of events as it gets across the same detail but much quicker and more subtly. So I'm going to give this a plus one. So we then go to Mars where Alex goes to visit Bobby Draper. She's working out and tells him that he's right, that he was down and she was being a shitty friend, but she still is being very standoffish toward him. Alex demands to know why she's shutting him out, and when Bobby asks shutting him out of what, Alex replies that he doesn't know and that's the problem. So Bobby then takes him to her hidden room where she has all the black market supplies she's bought during the course of her investigation. Alex asks if she's selling any of this stuff and she says of course not, that Avicerella is paying her to buy it in order to investigate who's selling all the military equipment on the black market. Alex asks why she's investigating Martians for Earth, but Bobby answers that Avicerella is the only one she sure isn't in on it, so she's the only one she can trust. Alex then sees a Goliath battlesuit and says, no way, but Bobby explains it gets worse as she believes they're selling stealth missile technology, which freaks Alex out as that kind of weaponry could be used to attack a planet, and Bobby replies that now you can see why Alva Sorella is so interested. Alex asks uh, why uh, she doesn't just go to the police, and Bobby laughs, saying that the police are in on it, uh, as are the military. Bobby then brings up a hologram murder board uh, with all the people of interest that she thinks may be involved in this conspiracy. Alex recognizes someone, Admiral Sovater, whom he served with, and Alex says that uh, he has more dust than blood in his veins, that there's no way he could be involved, but Bobby explains that uh, he signed a bunch of transfer orders for people who are involved, and Alex thinks that she's stretching. But Bobby explains she doesn't have much to go on. Alex asks, uh, asks if she's talked to Sovater, but Bobby explains that he's a high-ranking military officer who teaches at a war college that they don't exactly run in the same circles. But Alex says that uh, he would talk to he would talk to him. So in the novels, Bobby goes out to dinner with Alex and they have a cordial conversation as she's never standoffish to him. Afterwards, she explains that she's investigating missing Martian military technology, mostly ships, and asks for Alex's help. As ships uh, mostly involve naval officers and they wouldn't really talk to her as she's a Marine and Alex having served in the Navy might have a better luck. She wasn't buying black market military equipment as she was here in the show and as her investigation was more focused on ships, but she did have a list of people she suspected. 
Alex said that he would think about it, and several days later he shows up at her place to turn her down, but there Bobby is being held against her will and interrogated, and then a fight ensues when Alex discovers them, which I'll get more into in another scene. But after the fight, Alex changes his mind and agrees to speak to his old Navy friends. He talks to a man he once served with, and this man points him in the direction of an officer named Commander Duarte, who would be the best person to talk to about missing ships. And there are things that I like and I don't like about both versions. I don't like how in the show Bobby is standoffish toward Alex and has to be pushed in order to include him in the investigation. The book's version where she actively seeks his help makes a lot more sense to me. But I do prefer the show's version where it isn't about missing ships, rather Bobby's been buying all this military grade technology in order to investigate the conspiracy. And they did a bit of nice foreshadowing of Marco Anaris' attack on Earth by mentioning that this weaponry could be used to an attack a planet. So I'm going to give this uh, the slight edge uh, over the books and I'm going to give this a plus one. Then we go back to Earth. Uh, where Amos Burton is scoping out a street corner in Baltimore as he watches a thug selling drugs. He goes up to the thug and asks if he works for Eric. The thug says that he doesn't know any Eric, and when Amos persists, the thug shows him his gun in the holster and tells him to get lost, but Amos grabs his gun and starts hitting him and beating him down. The thug begs Amos to stop hitting him, so he does, and drags him to his feet and says that he needs a friend to take a message to Eric for him and tells him uh, to tell him that Amos Burton wants to talk. And Amos asks the thug if he wants to be his friend. The thug nods, so Amos lets him go. The thug says that Eric is going to kill him, and Amos responds by saying, I thought we were friends. So in the novels, Amos goes to hide to a hideout at night and scopes out the place waiting for someone to leave. When a young girl who is clearly an addict and a thug leaves, he asks her about Eric. When she refuses to answer, he grabs her arm and insists. Amos even uses a belter term during this exchange, which she doesn't understand and tells him to speak English. Another thug sees this and warns Amos to let her go, so Amos does and she runs off. The thug, who the novels describe as a man mountain, tells Amos to get lost, but he says not until he gets to speak to Eric. So the man mountain attacks Amos, but Amos maneuvers around him and pins him down and gets him in a chokehold and tells him that he needs a friend to get a message to Eric and asks if he wants to be his friend, so the thug agrees. Now, I do get why the show left out the part where Amos accosts a young girl who is defenseless against him. Now, granted, she's a thug and Amos doesn't intend to actually harm her, but he still threatens her and physically restrains her, which I could see could make some people uncomfortable. And plus, it's unnecessary, as the scene works perfectly fine as portrayed in the show. Also, I understand why they didn't make the thug a man mountain in the show, as uh, in just a couple of episodes, Amos faces off against another man mountain, so having him do it here might make the other encounter seem repetitive. I do like the part in the novels where he speaks Belter, which is uh, alien on Earth. It illustrates how uh, removed Amos now is from this environment, so I was sad that they didn't include this in the show, but overall I prefer the show's version, so I'm going to give this a plus two. So next we go back to Tycho where we see Bull on a screen talking to Fred Johnson and Holden about Monica Stewart's abduction. He said the video footage around the time that uh, she was abducted was erased and there's no trace on where she might have been taken. Holden says she could be anywhere, but Johnson states that he locked down the station. Holden tells Fred there's people that work for him that are in on it, but Fred says uh, they don't know that for sure and that she uh, is still here on the station somewhere. They just need to find her. 
When, uh, we then see Monica in a cargo container tied up calling out to speak to someone, but uh, no one's responding. In the novels, not only was the video footage erased, but someone overrode the lock on her door and put it back in place without anyone noticing. So it was clear that someone for, who worked for Johnson was in on it, which was the most disturbing part for Johnson. Also in the novels, Johnson didn't just mention casually that he locked down the station. A much bigger deal was made out of it, and it's not until they open a container that they think that she's in and find out that she's not in it that he locks down the station, which everyone who works for him sees as a very drastic step. Sakai is particularly upset, saying that they're losing thousands of dollars every hour that they're shut down, and it's ridiculous to do it just for one missing person. But Johnson uh, dismisses his concerns as he's more upset that he has people working for him that betrayed him. Now, as for the line that she's on the station somewhere, in the novels, Holden says this, but Johnson corrects him that there's a possibility that they killed her and had her body fed to the recyclers, in which case they'll never find her, which kind of raises the stakes. Now, I kind of like that they made a bigger deal out of shutting down the station uh, better, as well as the stakes that Monica could have been killed already and they wouldn't know it, so I'm going to give this a negative one. So next we go to Mars where we see Alex uh, goes to the War College to speak to Admiral Silverterre only to find him in the middle of a lecture. The lecture is about battle tactics in the ring space and he brings up how each ring gate is a choke point. He ends his lecture by saying the dream of Mars can go beyond just one planet but be a vision of humanity that can encompass a thousand stars. After the lecture, Alex says hello to Admiral Silverterre, who recognizes him, and Alex mentions he uh, actually went through the ring gates and says that he can tell him all about it over coffee, but Silverterre says that he that Alex flies a stolen Martian warship for an Earther captain, so they don't have anything to talk about, and then he walks away. However, Alex is then approached by Silverterre's aide, Lieutenant Babbage, who says that she'd love to hear of his exploits beyond the ring gate over coffee, so Alex accepts and they set a time to meet. When Babbage returns to Silver Silverterre, he orders her to find out what Alex knows. So in the novels, Admiral Silverterre and Lieutenant Babbage only appear in the epilogue uh, which the season finale covers. Alex doesn't talk to either of them earlier. Uh, as I mentioned before, Alex sees an old friend who suggests he talk to Commander Duarte. And as we learn at the end of the season, Duarte is the mastermind behind the exodus of uh, the Martian Splinter Group to Laconia and is their leader, known as Admiral Duarte, who is name-dropped in the show. So the show did include his name, but he doesn't make an appearance like he did in the books, mostly because the show doesn't want to be tied to uh, casting just for a cameo this season and would rather wait until they cover books 7 through 9, if they ever do, so that they can take Duarte's casting more seriously. So they use Silverterre and Babbage instead. Also, this scene, uh, Silverterre refers to uh, the ring gates as a chunk a choke point which foreshadows how the Martian Splinter Group sets up mines at the Laconia Gate to prevent anyone else from passing through. And also he talks about spreading the dream of Mars to a thousand stars which is the aim of the Laconians. Uh, that's what they're doing so it's foreshadowing uh, his ultimate plans. It's also interesting how Silverterre rejects Alex's offer and sends Babbage instead to gather information which is an obvious tactic. So in the novels, when Alex meets with um, Duarte, it's not obvious Duarte is responsible for what he's investigating, but here it's very obvious uh, that Silverterre is. And although I do like how they foreshadowed what the Laconians do at the end of the season, I found Alex actually talking to the mastermind and having no idea that he was more fascinating, so I'm going to give this a negative one. 
So then we get a shot of a UN asteroid spotter in space as an asteroid appears to fly by it without being detected. We then go to Luna to see Avasarella talking to her daughter who asks her to try to talk to Arjun, but Christian says that he's busy and doesn't want to be disturbed, but her daughter tries to convince her that he does want to see her, but he's too stubborn to say it. But Avasarella again refuses and her daughter leaves unhappy. Next, we see Avasarella in a meeting with Nancy Gal, Admiral Delgado, and several other UN officials discussing ships going through the ring gates, and they talk about how there could be some shadow activity involved by the Belters. So Avasarella bring, brings up the possibility that the science ship around Venus that was destroyed was destroyed by Marco Inaros, but Admiral Delgado refuses to back her up, only saying that the possibility is 50-50. So Nancy Gow tells Avasarella that this isn't the job she was sent to do and that if she'd rather not attend these meetings she could just submit her thoughts in writing. So in other words, Gal tells her to shut up or leave. And Avasarella being chastised only says, understood. So in the novels we get no hint um, that there are asteroids approaching Earth. Also, Avasarella and Arjun have not had a falling out at this stage, and her daughter doesn't beg her to see him. In fact, uh, I have to correct myself from a previous video where I mentioned Avasarella was stationed on Luna when she spoke to Amos, which is actually incorrect. Avasarella was on fa in fact on Earth at this stage. It's only later when she travels to Luna to meet with the Martian Prime Minister who is traveling there for a conference. But more on that later. As far as Nancy Gal's meeting goes, as mentioned before in the books, Nancy didn't defeat her in an election, and in fact, Alvisarella helped her win it, and there aren't they aren't on bad terms. So if she suspected a plot from Anaros, Gal would have listened to her, but she didn't suspect anything in the novels. So I really like the subtle foreshadowing of the asteroids sneaking past the asteroid spotter. It creates a ticking clock that wasn't in the books. Although it was a shock when the asteroids hit Earth in the novels uh, that the show has taken away, but to be honest, I was very confused and unclear on what happened when the asteroids hit in the book, so I actually prefer to have this foreshadowing. It creates a level of subtle background tension throughout these scenes. However, as for Arjun and Christian refusing to speak to each other, which makes his death even more tragic, I find it completely unnecessary and a bit overdoing it. As tragic enough as is, you don't need to add the extra bit of irony. As for the meeting with Gal, I have mixed feelings on this because it does create more tension as Avasarella knows things are coming but no one will listen to her, but it also doesn't make much sense to me that Gal would just shut her down like this even if she doesn't like her she knows that she has worth but overall i really like the foreshadowing of the incoming attack so i'm going to give this a plus two so back on Tycho, Fred Johnson and Bull are arguing over Fred's decision to lock down Tycho Station, where Bull warns he could lose control of the station, but Johnson argues that he already did, and that's when Holden interrupts them. Holden sees uh, that Monica Stewart's hand terminal is beeping. When Johnson asks what he did, Holden says that he saw a button, so he pushed it, and then Johnson asks if that's really how he goes through life. But they found uh, that he um, uh, activated a hidden camera on her retina, which they view the footage from to determine that she's in a shipping container. So Paul and Holden go out in the spacesuits to a shipping container uh, that is warm and has atmosphere, so they suspect that's where she is. And they cut a hole in it to attempt to rescue her. Meanwhile, we see inside the container, Monica tries to break out, not knowing the container is in space, so she compromises the seal and begins to lose oxygen. 
Hold in the bull, break through the container only to find live soil, so they have the wrong container. Then we see inside uh, Monica's container where she has run out of oxygen and is close to death, and that's when Holden and Bull cut through and Holden injects her with some oxygenated blood as they pump oxygen back into the container and save her life. She asks if she's alive and Holden smiles and tells her that she is and that uh, uh, had, had she not punctured the container, they would have never found her. Now, in the books... Um, it should be noted that only Fred Johnson and Holden are involved in this um, as Johnson feels that he can't trust anyone other than Holden, not even Drummer. And when they find Monica's hand terminal, it's cracked and can't be operated, so they have to get an engineer to repair it. And when Johnson's back is turned, Holden pushes the button, and we get the same line about there was a button, and I pushed it, and oh, is that really how you go through life, isn't it? And the footage does connect to Monica's camera, which in the novels is attached to her suit and not her retinas. Uh, Johnson immediately recognizes it as a shipping container and they find out which one has heat and Johnson and Holden go off to open the container and they do indeed find Monica inside of it uh, who is in a crash couch attached by IVs injecting her with drugs to keep her unconscious but Holden comes in and rescues her. So I love the line about the button, and I'm glad the show kept it. Although I am dubious about the fake out with the soil container, as I wonder if we really needed it. But I do like the show's version. Uh, has It has a lot more tension, and it does create a ticking clock, so I'm going to give this a plus two. So then we go back to Earth, where Amos is brought to see Eric. Uh, he's disarmed and brought into a locked and guarded building and brought up to a nice office on the upper floor where Eric is waiting for him. As soon as he enters, Eric complains that Amos Burton wants to see him is a sentence that doesn't make any sense as everyone knows that Amos Burton is dead. And then says, what the fuck are you doing, Timmy? Amos simply says uh, Lydia died. Eric tells him uh, that they had a deal, and Amos says that he's changing the deal. Eric tells him, fuck you, while getting a gun out. And tells him that uh, he has a lot of guts coming back, and Amos says that he's not back, that Lydia had a husband, and he, uh, he gets to keep the house. Eric is, re is relieved and tells Amos, sure, the old man can keep the house. Eric leaves the gun on the table as he gets a bottle of tequila to pour a couple of glasses. Amos pushes the gun towards Eric and tells him that he doesn't need to test him, that he's just here to help Charles. And Eric realizes he really is just here for the old man. So Amos drinks his tequila, then takes the bottle and walks away. Eric calls out to him and uh, tell him that he's changed and asks what happened to him out there. Amos just says one thing led to another and Eric says the same about himself, uh, showing off what he's accomplished, becoming a crime lord. They reminisce about how they used to watch the shuttles blast off when they were kids wishing uh, that they were on it. He then tells Amos that uh, Amos Burton's fake ID won't hold up under scrutiny and that it could lead back to him. Eric then tells Amos that he loves him and misses him, but if he shows his face in the city again, he's putting him down. Amos walks away and raises the bottle of tequila in salute and tells him that it was good seeing him. Now, in the novels, something similar went down when Amos uh, met with Eric as... At first, Eric thinks Amos has returned to take his empire away from him, but Amos tells Eric that uh, part of Lydia is still alive. Uh, Eric is confused when Amos mentions her husband Charles and tells Eric outright that he gets to keep the house. Period. Eric asks why the fuck he should care about uh, some old man, and Amos uh, answers that if he doesn't do it, that he'll kill him, he'll kill his two guards waiting outside, and he'll take everything that is his and give it to someone else who will do what he wants. Eric replies by saying, ah, there he is. When Amos asks there who is, Eric answers, Timmy. Uh, Eric then tells Amos that he's exactly the same, uh, and uh, 
Oh, Amos replies by saying, actually, I go out in space and fight monsters now, so that's different. Uh, which is kind of ironic because in the show, Eric tells Amos that he's changed, where in the books he says he stayed the same. So then Eric says that he'll keep paying the old man as it costs him virtually nothing and it's worth it to keep Timmy out of his city. Eric also gives Amos tequila and when Amos says uh, that uh, this shit is very good and calls uh, the Belter stuff undrinkable, Eric offers him a couple of bottles which Amos says he won't say no to. Eric then tells Amos to get the fuck out of his city. And as Amos prepares to leave, Eric tells him that the gun wasn't loaded, that there were poison darts hidden in the ceiling lights that would kill everyone in the room that wasn't him as soon as he said a key word. Amos thanks him for not saying the word, and Eric responds by saying, thanks for still being my friend. Amos smiles at him and leaves. Eric's guards were waiting for him outside his office with a box of tequila that they give to Amos. So, the show's version uh, brings up the original Amos Burton a lot where the novels don't touch on that at all. This backstory was probably covered in the short story The Churn, so it doesn't really go over uh, those events again in the book the way that the show does. And so, Eric isn't afraid... Um, that his uh, fake ID won't hold up the way he is in the show. Also in the novels, they don't reminisce about the times they were watching ships blast off, but rather Amos reminisces about that in his uh, viewpoint chapters. But of course, if the show wants to include it, it has to do it through dialogue, as you can't get Amos' thoughts uh, in the show the way you can in the books. Also in the show, Amos outright tells Eric that he doesn't need to test him with the gun, whereas in the novels it was only implied that Eric was testing him with the gun. Also in the show, Amos just takes the bottle of tequila, whereas in the books, Eric gives him a whole box. But the biggest change I noticed is that there was no mention of poison dart that would have killed Amos instantly, which to me changes the whole dynamic of the scene. Sure, uh, they still could have been there in the show, but they weren't mentioned, so unless you read the books, uh, you wouldn't know about them. And I think the scene really loses something because of that, so I'm going to give this a negative 2. We then go back to Luna, where Avicerella and Delgado are sharing a drink at the bar. Avicerella complains about Nancy Gal being petty by having to humiliate her like that. Delgado points out it was probably because of the way uh, that she used to treat her when she was in charge, but Avicerella claims that she was just toughening her up. Delgado then suggests in a metaphor that the old need to make way for the young, as it's the way it's always been, but Avicerella says fuck that. Avasarella then asks Delgado if he really thinks it's Inaros that destroyed the science ship. Delgado says it's too risky for belter ships to raid ships in the inner system so it never happens. So Avasarella concludes that it wasn't uh, piracy and asks Delgado what he thinks it could be if it wasn't piracy. Delgado tells Avasarella uh, he uh, knows what she's doing implying that she's trying to get him to investigate uh, the Inaro's connection and she asks him if it's working to which he only responds to by smiling. So as mentioned before Avasarella didn't have any viewpoint chapters in book 5 and therefore doesn't appear that much so all this material is original material for the show that wasn't in the novels including Delgado himself. But I like that it gives her something to do and it shows how she's always out investigating people up to no good even if others won't investigate it. So I'm going to give this a plus 2. We then get a flashback of Amos as a young boy where he's got a bloody wound on his head and is talking to Lydia on the docks. Lydia praises him for not fighting back, saying that it was a tough thing to do. She then tells him that she loves him, 
but that she isn't righteous or a good person. But, uh, but she asks to make a deal that she'll pretend to be righteous if he pretends to love her enough to listen to her, and that perhaps that's all people like them need. We then flash forward to Amos on the docks in present times thinking about the past as a group of teenage thugs then approach Amos and ask what he's doing on their docks. Amos simply says no and then stands up to intimidate them and repeats no. The intimidation works and they pretend to brush him off and walk away. Amos then calls Avasarella and calls her Chrissy and tells her that he's going to need a favor as he's sure that he's never coming back to Earth again and that there's someone he wants to see and he'll need her help to do it. He then walks away as a ship takes off in the background. So in the books we don't get a flashback like this, perhaps this material was covered in the churn but I can't say as to my shame I have yet to read uh, that short story. But it does show him sitting on the docks reminiscing about how he and Eric used to watch the ships take off when a group of thugs approach him and he tells them to find someone else and intimidates them enough to leave. Later after he returns to his hotel room he then calls Avasarala the next day and they hold a conversation where he asks for her help uh, has he sure that he's never coming back to earth. Avasarala gives him mock disappointment uh, <laughs> that Amos won't return to Earth and informs him that she's going to Luna to meet with the Martian Prime Minister. Uh, Amos then says that he wants to see Clarissa Mal. So I absolutely love having the flashback there. It really drives home how important Lydia was to him in his life and shaping the person that he became. It also explains his desire to follow people like Holden and Naomi who are righteous as they provide him with the role models he never had growing up. I also like the contrast to when the gang tries to attack him to the Belter gangsters who are running the protection racket on the freighter, as in that case he welcomed the fight and used it as an excuse to fight and actually felt alive and invigorated by the fight, whereas here he turned down the excuse to fight as he was just emotionally exhausted and tired and just didn't want to deal with it. The conversation with Avicerella works for me either way, but the flashback I felt was amazing and really elevated this scene from the books as it really explains a lot about Amos' character in one scene, so I'm going to give this a plus four. So my final adaptation score for Churn is a plus three. Not a high score as the episode fared pretty evenly with the books not straying too far one way or the other. Uh, that is until the ending with the flashback which I thought was amazing which is what finally put the score into the positive. So overall a decent adaptation where pretty much both versions of the story work equally well. So that's it for my book to show comparison for The Expanse Season 5, Episode 2. I shall be back in about a week for my book to show coverage of Season 5, Episode 3. So be sure to keep an eye out for, th for that as well as many other videos I do on The Expanse as well as covering other shows like Star Trek, Breaking, <coughs> Breaking, ba Breaking Bad, The Outer Limits, and more. So be sure to subscribe to keep up with all of that. And thanks a lot for watching.